So, uh, hello, ladies, and welcome back to HeartSpring. Uh, today we have a wonderful special guest. Her name is Esther Nicholson. And uh, Esther is a dear friend who I met at the She Recovers Conference in 2018 in Los Angeles. And um, so I want to tell you a little bit about her. Esther is an agape licensed spiritual therapist, and she's been studying with Michael Bernard Beckwith um, for many years at Agape. Um, she's also a really wonderful motivational speaker and a very accomplished singer. If you haven't heard her sing, um, I suggest that you take a listen because it really is so moving. Um, and she's got this process she calls soul recovery. So I'm going to invite Esther to tell you a little bit more about that. Um, really, really wonderful uh, to have you here with us, Esther. So I want to just invite you to say hello and um, tell us a little bit more about who you are and what you do and why you do it. Okay. Well, I'm Esther Nicholson, and I'm the CEO and founder and author of Soul Recovery. Um, my program is uh, the, roadmap, the Roadmap Home to Your Authentic Self. And that has a lot to do with my why of why this work is so um, important to me is because on November 1st, I uh, celebrated 35 years of recovery. And, you know, when, when we think about, you know, recovering from, I was addicted to crack cocaine, I was addicted to um, food, I was addicted to men, I was addicted to so many things outside of myself, but when I really got into the uh, deepest healing that, to the deepest healing that I've ever done, I really understood, I really got it. And this had to come from such a place of pain and humility to get to this place is that the drug addiction, the unhealthy love addiction, the food addiction, the, all the addictions um, that accompanied that had their root in my emotional addiction to unworthiness and not being good enough and shame. And then I realized, oh wow, before I became addicted to crack cocaine, I was addicted to these emotions. I didn't know who I was without being afraid. I didn't know who I was without being anxious or ashamed or some kind of drama or always in some kind of you know, uh, crisis <laughs> support. Um, I didn't know my life. I didn't know my identity as anything other than that. And so when I started really doing this work on a deeper level and I tapped into my essence, I tapped into who I was before I forgot. I forgot, I, I remembered, I, I caught a glimpse of, of who I was before it had been numbed out of me or trauma, trauma, trauma out of me. And when I glimpsed that part, which I call the authentic self, your higher self, God, or whatever it is that you want to call it, I became obsessed with that part of me. It's like, oh my God, that's freedom. That's peace. Like I, I didn't know that peace existed. I had this theory about what it meant. Like if you did what I wanted you to do, or if things went the way I wanted them to go, I'd feel peace. But when I felt that inner peace, that is really who I am. I became really, um, that's how soul recovery is, was created is, oh, we're not here to recover from anything. We're here to recover and rediscover who we really are. We're here to unlearn, unlearn the false identity that we've taken on to, in order to protect ourselves and to awaken to something, to, to that part of you that is so badass, so empowered, so sweet, so beautiful, so precious, so enough that you, know, you don't tap into often enough, right? So um, that's my why, is I want to support everyone that I can in returning to who they really are before it got scared out of them, you know? Returning to your authentic self with the recovery of your soul, that part of you that only knows how great you are. So uh, as you can see, I'm passionate about that. What <laughs> 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 like, kind of long answer to your question. <laughs> Esther, do you know the story of the golden Buddha? No, I don't, I do not. Okay, um, so you know Joseph Campbell? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Okay. So Joseph Campbell, when he talks about story, he says, actually, there's only one story and it's this story. Um, there's a city somewhere in Asia and um, there's an army coming. And so the people in the town say, oh, we've got to cover our golden Buddha that they have this huge, gorgeous golden Buddha in the temple. And so they cover it with mud and straw and the army comes and somehow they finally they get driven off. But it's been so many years that they've been at war that they've forgotten about the golden Buddha. And so one day there's a man kneeling down and praying before the golden Buddha and a chunk of mud falls on his head and he looks up and he sees the gold and he starts to tear away the mud and the straw and he sees oh, there's a golden Buddha underneath. But in a way, this is every story. And this is what you're talking about, right? Like the soul recovery, the soul remembering. The soul, the soul remembering. And um, I remember the first time I experienced that I was uh, in the back of a taxi demanding that he take me to get my last hit of cocaine. And he pulled over his cab and turned to face me in the back seat. And he said, young lady, please don't kill yourself today, which that's a wonderful thing. That's a beautiful thing, but that wasn't the miracle. The miracle was like the moment this person, this angel looked into my eyes, it was like a curtain lifted, a veil parted, and I saw my soul. And I saw, I felt, it's very, it, it, it is indescribable as it's supposed to be to the human mind, but I had never felt such freedom and peace and like there was no fear. I didn't even know what fear was. I, there was nothing but light and love and me. I was like me for the first time ever that I could remember. And then the veil shut again. Um, it was just enough for me to tell the cab to turn around and take me home instead of going to the dope dealer's house and to start me on this journey of, oh man, that made me homesick for home. Like, oh man, that's who I really am. And, you know, of course, over the years, there's been time, you know, it's like that part gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then there are still times it's like, where the fuck are you? <laughs> you know, so anyway, yes, the golden <laughs> Yeah. So you had that moment. And I think that's, you know, I love what you talked about of like the window kind of, it's permeable. It doesn't, it's not like one day it opens and then it stays there. You know, it kind of moves around. And, you know, our topic this month at HeartSpring is forgiveness. And I wonder what part do you think forgiveness plays in that movement, in that, you know, permeable sort of veil? And, and maybe opening the veil. So I would first of all say that every aspect of the roadmap back to your authentic self is just as important as the next, right? Because you could be forgiving, very forgiving, which is a huge spiritual principle that must be adhered to if you're gonna have any kind of peace or clarity or be able to part that, that veil. But let's say you're forgiving, but you're stingy or you're forgiving, um, but you have no boundaries for yourself, or you're forgiving, you know, and, you know, you're filled with anxiety or something like that, you know, or th there might be some other kind of thing. So forgiveness is huge, a huge part of clearing the deck and allowing us to tap into our authentic self, but it's not the only part. Mm -hmm. But what I, what I truly believe though, if you sincere, if, if, if you sincerely, um, engage in the forgiveness process because it does open up the veil so so wide that you you are tapped you, you you tap into that infinite wisdom that is you that is the golden buddhist golden golden goddess um within you that really directs you to your next steps so all of these powerful spiritual principles um that some of us shy away from because you know let, let's face it Forgiveness is the hardest thing you will ever, ever, ever have to do. How easy it is to forgive someone that traumatized you or abused you or molested you or betrayed you uh, in some way. It's like the, the wounded, the wounded, not the soul, but the wounded aspect of our, of our unconscious mind, which is trauma, right? It's, it's almost, it's, impo it's impossible to forgive from that, from the level of uh, woundedness, you can begin the process of forgiveness, 
from the level of woundedness, but the forgiveness comes at a much higher vibrational frequency, right? So you are led to that frequency. So I think that one of the most important things I can say is that forgiveness is a process. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Let's talk a little bit more about that process about, you know, how do we get there? Um, how do we get there? <laughs> and how do you approach that through soul recovery? The first, um, the first uh, direction on, on, the, on the roadmap is to, first of all, fully embrace, acknowledge, and be with how absolutely outraged, resentful, angry, scared you are because you can't do a bypass on that and a lot of people in the world do try to do a bypass on that because being an unforgiveness is so painful that you hear a lot of people say and maybe um you ladies have said this yourself i know i've said it well you know i'm just going to be the bigger person and i'm going to forgive or you know i understand that they've you know had a screwed up life. So, you know, I'm going to have compassion and I'm going to forgive them. I, I just forgive them. It's in the past, whatever, or time heals all wounds and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Um, I just kind of lost my track, my train of thought from, I'm having a menopause sleepy moment. It's okay though. <laughs> what was I saying? <laughs> um, okay. So going through the process oh, the and process. the process, I got it. Okay. So, um, so that the first part of the process is acknowledging that you're so angry, that you're so sad, that you're so resentful, all of that. And then once you can embrace that, you know, from the soul recovery perspective, you know, we start to tap on that. And I don't know if any of you uh, ladies know about the emotional freedom technique, which is um, uh, a combination of Chinese acupuncture and spiritual psychology. So what I take people through is like when we can acknowledge the rage and the anger and the pain and the trauma, and we can, you know, rate that or gauge that on what scale of uh, vibrationally are they are with that? Like, are they a five or a 10? We start the tapping process to start bringing that down to a zero, right? Mm -hmm. and, then, and then as we're, as we're bringing that down, other layers of the issue start to come up right? Because whatever it is that you're sitting in unforgiveness with, there's a whole nother layer of what you've made that mean unconsciously or consciously. And then there's another layer of that, right? And then there's another layer of that, which, which brings you to a whole new understanding of why you've been holding on to this and your pattern with this, right? And, and you know, then we can begin the process of compassion and accountability. Mm, I so, love that. Yeah, self-forgiveness, a, a huge part of forgiveness, period, is self-compassion. Self-compassion. I'm, um, I, from, in soul recovery, I pull from so many resources. And I also pull some things from the Bible. And that might turn some people off, but I want you to share with you that when I, when I look at something in the Bible, I'm thinking about it from a metaphysical universal perspective, you know? And so um, when I heard, you know, the story, and there are so many stories about Jesus, right? But when he was being crucified and we all go through our crucifixions, right? We're all on the floor in the fetal position at some point in our lives or many points in our lives. But the people who were persecuting him, he said, forgive, Father, forgive them because they know not what they do. They don't know what they're doing. And so in self-compassion, I go within and I say, I am forgiven because I don't know what I'm doing. I am forgiven because from this place of fear and trauma and fil you know, filtering through my intergenerational stuff you know, that has been encoded in my DNA, I forgive myself because I know not what I do. That self-humility and that self-compassion just takes all the pressure off of me to try to do this perfectly because you can't do forgiveness perfectly and you can't even forgive yourself perfectly, but there's something within you that can wipe it away. Mm. That part of the process, there's the inner child part of the process where I just 
hold onto my belly because that's where I feel her a lot, you know, and I talk to her and I, I let her rage. I let her be sad. I let her cry. I, you know, I rock. You know, it's called, it's a part, of, part of the process is called rocking the baby, you know, rock the baby because there are times when you're going to tap, when you're going to, you know, uh, do the other aspects of the process. And like, she's still fitful. You know how a baby is, 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 is fitful after you've changed them and burped them and fed them and played with them and they're still fitful. Then you have to just sit with them and rock the baby until the baby feels safe. And so that's another huge part of forgiveness because if you're, if you're not in forgiveness and you're in resentment, it probably means you've been traumatized about something, right? Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. And when we're in fight or fight, flight or freeze, and we're responding from that place, when you can just stop for a moment and understand why you're responding from that place, it doesn't condone it, but it helps you have compassion for it. And then when you can see yourself from, the, and from that lens, then you can maybe open up a little bit to see the person who offended you from that lens. Mm. I love this. I love how you're talking about it being a process and starting with just acknowledging, acknowledging the hurt, acknowledging the anger and being where you're at, right? And even that is the beginning of self-compassion, isn't it? Of just Absolutely. Absolutely. Because most of us, what do we do? Oh, I'm angry. I shouldn't be. Oh, I should be over it by now. You idiot, blah, 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 blah. But when you could just stop all that dialogue, I say, oh just hurt. I'm just so disappointed. I'm just so freaking angry at this person. Then that begins the process. And then you start tapping. It's like, oh, underneath the anger is confusion. Right? Under the confusion is overwhelm. Right? Under the overwhelm is, is I want approval. Because I want to do it perfectly. Under I want to do it perfectly is, oh, I want to do it perfectly because I don't think I'm good enough as I am. You know, so I'm almost starting to cry as I'm fucking doing this, um, guys, because as I'm tapping, some shit is coming up. <laughs> right? Isn't that always the way? I mean, I used to have this acting. Why is I should pay you? What do I owe you? <laughs> right? <laughs> There's always more to do. There's always more to do, right? And there's always more layers to uncover. Yes. Yeah, so forgiveness is, uh, so that's a part of the process of forgiveness, you know, and just, you know, another part is, is releasing the resistance. We have resistance to forgiveness because our egoic minds, which is the part of us that doesn't remember that it's safe, believes, well, if I forgive this person, I'm condoning them. If I'm forgiving them, then I'm not safe because then they're going to do it again. And so there's so much resistance to even for considering forgiving this person. Um, and I think it's because forgiveness is so um, widely misunderstood that my forgiving you has nothing to do with my letting you back into my personal space to, to do it again. And it's not that I'm not holding, it's not that I'm holding on to unforgiveness. It's just that forgiveness has tapped me now into the power of discernment where I can understand that you're just where you are and where you are is not a vibrational match for me, but I can, but, but now you're allowed safe passage through my consciousness. I don't have to hold on to that just because I no longer choose to have that energy in my life. Yeah. Right. So yeah. For this doesn't mean that you're letting someone back in to, to, to your personal space when there hasn't been an emotional or spiritual change for all concern that brings that together naturally, right? So it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean you have to agree with what they say or what they do or what they're about, but what you're committed to is freeing yourself at the deepest level that you possibly can from the place of where you are and your understanding, because your freedom is self-love. Your mm -hmm. freedom is self-value. And nobody is worth that. No one's worth that. And it doesn't say that, oh my God, this horrible thing didn't happen to me. This horrible thing. 
happened. Right? It happened. And then we can take that horrible thing out and put it on the table. Let's look at that thing. Let's look at that event. Let's look at that experience. Let's process through that. Because once we process through the event itself or the circumstance itself, we can also begin to heal because what unforgiveness is, is that event, I keep that event active in my consciousness. So I'm being traumatized by it all the time. It's like, screw that. I've been traumatized by it once. Let me put this sucker on the table so I can stop traumatizing myself with this event or, and this story about this event. Let me deal with the event itself. So through tapping, we aim directly on the event. Through doing a personal inventory, we aim directly on the event. When doing our inner child stuff, we deal directly with the event. And then the event starts to unfold more and more and more layers of our consciousness and where we've been holding pain. But when you think about that event again, there's no attachment. There's no, and you can always tell whether there's attachment or that, whether there's something unhealed going on. Because when you think of the, uh, the, the situation or the event that, that caused you harm, there'll be times, I mean, if you're healed from it, you won't feel any connection to it, right? It's not because you're numbed out or shut down. It's because, wow, I handled it. I mean, it's over. Or you think, or you'll think that it's over. And then this uh, situation will be presented to you in memory or someone will say something and your, your gut is going to immediately tell you what's up. Right. Your gut will always <laughs> tell you whether you're in, you know, whether you have some more work to do on that issue or not. Absolutely. And I feel like, you know, we're all about relationships here and, um, you know, and sex, love and dating and specifically um, in this process of our healing journey. And I feel like, you know, forgiveness has such a bearing on that, on all of our relationships. Um, so I'm just wondering, you know, what, what your experience is about that. Um, in terms of relationships, intimate relationships, are you speaking mm -hmm. about that specifically? Yeah. Yeah. That's quite a process as well. Um, so what I've done, <clears throat> what I guide people to do, <clears throat> work with me, especially people who are having chronic um, or consistent relationship issues. And why do they continue to have the same relationship expecting different results is because it's, it's the, they're the main character in the play and that's who keeps showing up <clears throat> in the relationship. So I think the first thing to do is to do an inventory of your relationships, right? And doing an inventory of your relationships and looking at every belief in, in a personal inventory in the third column, we're always looking at our belief system because your belief system is really the only thing that's causing you pain. Your belief creates <clears throat> actions and your actions create patterns. And then it's, it's just this vicious loop. So in making an inventory of your, of your intimate relationships, like let's say take your top five, right? And you do an inventory on that. And in that inventory, you're also tapping, you know, and you're getting, and, and it's like, as you're tapping, you're getting to what this was really all about in the first place. And then you get to see from a place of compassion and accountability, why I even chose this person, why I was with this person. Oh my God, this person is the last five people I've been with. Oh my God, what's going on with me? Well, now I get to my core wounds abandonment, betrayal, rejection, unworthiness, not good enoughness, not feeling safe, feeling insignificant, feeling excluded, feeling damaged, feeling broken. Well, if that's operating in my consciousness, no matter how good I look or how I'm, how I'm jamming in the world, when I attract someone from a deep, intimate level, they're going to match me. They're going to match me. And if I'm holding on to unhealed resentment and pain about past relationships, I'm going to attract the same person until I get it right, until I heal that. That's just, that's, those are, that's the law of the universe. Ain't nothing personal. <laughs> <laughs> this is the law of the universe. So, you know, as I continue to do this work, because I've had to look at you know, I, I've had this pattern of either being in something, being very excited about it, or spending long 
times, um, long periods alone and single or getting into something, being excited about it and then finding the old me, the false identity showing up as this relationship. I think when you can really, really get that, no one, you invite everyone into your life. And when you can really get that and start doing your own inner work and start healing old relationships and, he, and, and, and forgiving yourself for in, in, those, in those old relationships, then that uncovers a, the golden Buddha, who you really are. And as you discover and awaken to who you really are, then you start attracting relationships and situation that, situations and circumstances and conditions that, that's a match for that. You have the power, but you got to know that you have the power. And so we unlearn, I don't have the power and I don't have any control over this. Now, Einstein says you can't heal the problem at the level that created the problem in the first place. So the part of you that's scared and anxious and you know impulsive and blah, 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 that's not the part of you that's gonna ever solve the problem. But the part of you that says, I am so willing to be the real me. I am so willing to see myself the way the universe really sees me. That part of you, as you rise in frequency, that part of you, is the answer to the problem. You don't have a relationship problem out there. You have a relationship disconnection in here. It's just waiting for you to come back home. That's all. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I so powerful. Again. Yes. <laughs> yes, girl. Yes. <laughs> It really is, you know, I mean, this, the relationship we have with ourselves um, and, and with that deep, true, original golden goddess Buddha part of ourselves, right? Um, and the ability to acknowledge that and embrace that and, you know, the willingness to pull back the veil and see that in ourselves compassion and accountability because you're gonna you're gonna pull back some stuff and say oh my god I didn't even realize I was operating from that place like what was it what were you thinking and it's like it's okay you weren't thinking not from your highest self you were thinking from your self-preservation self the, the part of you that's trying to keep you safe right so we just want to love her and give her give her a break for a minute you know and then start as you, the more and more and more that you do the excavation, you know, in the process and the golden Buddha is revealed, you'll be like, oh my God, look at what I created. You know, it's like, oh, I'm different. Wow, I'm not responding to that situation the way I used to, you know? Um, oh, when I think about a past a relationship that was really painful for me, it just passes through or I feel a deep sense of compassion. And, and gratitude that I grew through that. You know, I say, I'm so grateful for every man that ever left me because, <laughs> because, because I needed that to happen to go to the next level, you know, because the, old, the, the false identity holds on to some things that's not good for you, you know, but your higher self will kick you out to your greatness. And, and, and you can take it sweet or you could take it sour. It doesn't matter. But the more mm -hmm. that you self-value yourself, you're like, hey, I don't have to learn these lessons through a, a, an emotional crisis anymore. I deserve better than that. Mm. I have one last question for you. Uh, what advice would you give your younger self about love? That I'm it. That I'm it. And that no one can give it to you, sweetheart, and no one can take it away. You're it. You just be you and do your thing and, and just understand how adored you are just because. Yeah, how about that? This is what I would tell myself. How about that? You don't have to do anything special. You don't have to, you don't have to do anything. You're just so precious right as you are. I like, I mean, God, like feel that right now. Like you don't have to do anything. You don't have to work for anything. You don't have to figure it out. You don't have to 
put all the pieces together just as you are, totally naked, raw, rolls, <laughs> whatever, the cellulite, whatever, that like, oh God, look at you, you're so precious. That changes everything. It absolutely does.